The man coming out of the door at that moment was the mayor of New York City, Jimmy Walker. If these pictures seem to reflect a certain frivolity, you must remember they were taken at that wonderful carefree period in our history. The First World War had ended, and the second one was nowhere in sight. That youth on the right is Adolf Manju. Yes, notables from every walk of life visited San Simeon. That's Paul Block, the newspaper publisher, chatting with the mayor. The fellow kneeling down in front of this group is George K. Arthur, the comedian. And the attractive girl on the left in the print dress is Hedda Hopper. Standing next to Hedda is the founder of America's largest bank, A.P. Giannini. John Gilbert and his wife, Virginia Bruce. Claire Windsor and Dolores Del Rio. They're down at the tennis court, watching Chaplin hit a few to Bill Tilden. That teenager on the right is Carol Lombard. Nothing pleased the host more than when everybody got out of doors in the afternoon to take part in some group activity. He was proud of San Simeon and eager for his guests to enjoy it to the full. Many people have the sense of acquisitive possessiveness, but William Randolph Hearst was the only man ever able to indulge it to the hill. But it was a strange paradox that this fighting giant of journalism with all his vast collection of material wealth should also have a tender passion for the treasures of nature, flowers, trees, and animals. Yes, Mr. Hearst was a happy man at San Simeon, whether he was conducting business with his secretary or welcoming a famous guest like Lindy. In town, he was very reticent about having his picture taken, but up here he seemed to have no objection. He'd even kid about it. Part of the daily routine was to move the guests to the adjoining zoo to witness the feeding of the animals. ranch was at its peak. The zoo and game preserve, the largest private collection in the world, was established on 2,000 San Simeon acres, protected from the guests by an eight-foot high wire fence 10 miles long. Visitors were made aware of Mr. Hurst's tenderness toward animals when they drove up the mountainside, as they were confronted by large signs admonishing them to always drive slowly. As Hedda Hopper once said, a visit to the Hurst ranch was a ticket to Never Never Land. Never has there been such a place, and never will we see its likes again. As an animal collector, Mr. Hurst started modestly with a herd of rare, pure white fallow deer imported from Asia. Then, patriotically, he added Montana black buffalo, but had to go far afield again to gather exotic animals from all over the world. And when these animals stopped in the middle of the road, you stopped. Yes, there was hardly anything in the Bronx Zoo or any other great American collection that could not have been found at San Simeon at its peak. If you were with us at Malibu Beach a little earlier in this show, you'll recognize my old friend, Arthur Lake. Camels or horses, he's always been the bravest in our set. Watch out, Dagwood, or you'll get your arm in a sling again. Seriously, I'll always be indebted to Arthur for helping to make possible many of these pictures. He was the one who introduced me to Mr. Hurst. And that's Arthur's pretty wife, Pat Lake. She's Marion Davies' niece and was a great favorite of Mr. Hurst. She was also very helpful in persuading the host to pose for some of these pictures. Before I left that day, I had to take one more shot of that main entrance. Everything seemed so much the same that I almost expected our host to come out of the door. This next shot was Mr. Hurst's own idea. He said, let's make believe the camera's running backwards.
time came to leave, and we started down from the enchanted hill, a familiar quotation came to my mind. I think it was Kipling who said, the tumult and the shouting die, the captains and the kings depart. It seemed so true here at San Simeon. Long after its builders, vast newspaper chain and political influences are forgotten, he will be remembered as America's greatest art collector and the creator of San Simeon. I hope you don't mind me bringing you out on the stage like this, do you? Mind if you hadn't brought me out here, I'd have slugged you. <laughs> <laughs> well, what do you mean, Kurt? Well, I tell you, Ken, I just went up to Albany to visit my family. I have my six sisters and my mother. And, you know, I, I'm beginning to think they think I'm rather a failure because I'm not on television. Yeah. <laughs> you know what my mother said to me? She said, uh, Kirk, now, why aren't you a big star like Ken Murray? Oh. <laughs> A natural reaction. <laughs> what, what, what is, uh, seriously, what does she mean by that? Well, I'll tell you, Ken. Uh, she figures it out rather accurately. You see, my pictures come to Albany about, uh, oh, once, twice, sometimes three times a year, whereas the Ken Murray show gets there about every week. Yes. So every therefore, week. she wants to see me on television. Well, your ma's a real television fan, then. She watches she, our show, is that right? Well, she's watching it right now. That's why I'm here. I wanted she her is? to know that I know some big stars. Uh, Would you hey, mind? Ma, look at me. <laughs> That scene, of course, was taken some years ago. The occasion being Kirk Douglas's first appearance on television. At a time, I might add, when Hollywood frowned upon its stars appearing on the little 10-inch monster. Ten years passed before I got any more film on Kirk, but recently I caught up with him in the forecourt of Groman's Chinese Theater. He was signing the cement autograph book, carrying on a tradition that is one of the few active reminders of the glamour that made Hollywood great. Kirk Douglas became the 137th movie star to put his handprints in this Hall of Fame. Now I know what those poor newsreel cameramen go through. Shooting from the hip with a camera in a crowd like this is not the easiest thing in the world. But Kirk was very helpful. He arranged for me to get a very close shot when he put his hands in that sticky, gooey cement. He, he pulled a funny gag on me. Just before it all started, he said, Ken, this personal appearance stuff makes me nervous. Stick close to me, will you? And I did. For three days, my barber had to shave me with a chisel. This was only the second time I'd ever attended one of these shindigs. The first time was over 30 years ago. I'll never forget what a kick this was, to see Tom Mix in person. He'd been my boyhood idol on the silent screen since those days when I would go to the Nickelodeon with my pop every Saturday afternoon. I got to know him pretty well in his later years. This film was taken at his ranch in 1940. Tom was the first of the true cowboys and had a real exciting life. He began punching cattle at the age of 12. At 18, he was a rough rider with Teddy Roosevelt, then a Kansas sheriff and later a Texas ranger. I had to send this picture back to the folks. That's the original horse, Tony, who was 30 years old at that time. Tom Mix told me that day that he came to Hollywood in 1910, determined to make a million dollars. Well, he made it, and spent much of it on high-spirited horses, high-priced cowboy duds, and high-powered automobiles. You know, it's ironic that this man who had risked his life hundreds of times in daredevil stunts on horses should meet his death in an automobile. He was killed in this car two weeks after this picture was taken. And here's the fellow who introduced me to Tom, Johnny Mac Brown, quite an athlete himself. All-American football player, movie star, and one of the nicest fellows you ever met. Pretty fair horseman, too. Oh, well, you can't win them all. I lived with Johnny Mac for a while. We went to a lot of rodeos together. I got pictures of Hoot Gibson and Buck Jones. We even visited Hopalong Cassidy on location. I'm sure Bill Boyd never dreamed when he was making these pictures that someday he would revolutionize an industry that hadn't even been invented yet. 
I went on quite a western kick around that time. Got me a white horse like Hoppy's. Learned to spin a little rope. So that in the early 40s, when Jack Warner invited me to be the MC on a junket to Virginia City for a big premiere, I was really in the mood. This was a real exciting trip. In my whole life, I've never seen so many movie stars corral together. There's just too many here to name individually, but I got some good close-ups later on. There's the star of the picture, Errol Flynn. First stop, Reno. This was surely a great way to exploit pictures. How come we don't do this no more? We were all a little punchy by the time we hit Virginia City. That's Wayne Morris. Alan Hale agrees. He had a good time. Humphrey Bogart and Mayo Mathal. Jane Wyman. Mary Astor. My next door neighbor back home. There's Hoppy again. The grand old man of the movies, Hobart Bosworth. And a good friend, Leo Carrillo. On the way home, Warner Brothers arranged a side trip to Sun Valley. You know, when I was a kid, my ambition was to be a locomotive engineer. Riding in the cab of this Union Pacific engine was the nearest I ever came to. Sun Valley. This has always been Hollywood's favorite place for winter sports. pretty gal on vacation, June Allison. Errol Flynn was all set to relax, but they got him out to make the proverbial snowman. That pretty blonde sneaking up on the right is Martha O'Driscoll. When she hit Flynn with that hunk of snow, she certainly started something. They really gave her a bad time. <laughs> That's Johnny Weissman. Wayne Morris. Well, you see what Johnny does to that poor girl. That's Reggie Gardner. This is one of those wild Hollywood parties you're always reading about. And there's some guests from the hotel watching the goings on. Rory Calhoun in the middle. The gal on the right, of course, is Lucille Ball. These aren't the only pictures I have of Lucy. Here's one taken long before television. And here's another, taken on the set of a movie called Fancy Pants. That's George Marshall, the director, and Lucy Standard. And there's her co-star, old Ski Nose Hope. <laughs> Looks like he's trying to read between the lines. Lucy has made quite a few pictures with Bob. Their latest one is Critics' Choice. This particular day, Lucy had to do a scene where she took some falls, and boy, did she work hard. Now, mine, that was just a rehearsal. All right, action. Uh-oh, something went wrong, and she's got to do it again. Someone once said, that Lucille Ball stands alone as the greatest comedian of our time. And that, and that goes for sitting down, too. <laughs> 